Thank you for joining us today for a Global Supply Chain Week. My name is Eric Kulish, Air Cargo Editor at Freight Waves and American Shipper. There's been a lot of focus the past year on the pandemic as an existential threat to passenger airlines, how much money they are losing because of low travel demand, mass layoffs, bankruptcies and bailouts. And all cargo carriers are also in the public eye because of their involvement moving PPE and new vaccines to combat COVID. But often lost in the shuffle are airports, which provide the infrastructure that makes passenger and cargo travel possible. Airports Council International's most recent COVID-19 impact analysis revealed the global airport industry experienced a reduction of more than 6 billion passengers last year, representing a decline of 64% of global passenger traffic with a reduction in revenue of $112 billion. So joining us today to get an airport perspective on air cargo during the COVID era is Amir Pineda, Manager of Aviation Trade and Logistics for Miami-Dade Airport, uh, or, or better known as Miami International Airport. Amir, uh, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be with you, Eric. So Valentine's Day was just on Sunday, I believe, uh, and Miami's the biggest U.S. hub for flower imports. Huge amounts of flowers come in from South America, but also uh, going to Europe and, and, and within the United States. Several carriers said they moved more flowers this season, even though there was a pandemic. Tell us, can you tell us what how commodity flow looked like at MIA and why do you think flower shipments were, were more? Sure, um, it, it's a great question and thank you for that. Uh, I, I think really uh, the, the reason lies with uh, people just wanting to send flowers to their loved ones during this pandemic uh, period that we're suffering through right now. Uh, part of that is is obviously the sharing of, of flowers brings brightness and happiness to, to people's lives. So I think the demand for flowers was probably higher uh, this year than maybe in years past. And what we uh, what, what occurred here at the airport was basically a um, an increase in flowers. Uh, we we expected to have a, approximately two to three percent above uh, last year. And what we're experienced from what we're getting from the carriers is, you know, like Latam and Avianca, up seven to six percent, uh, uh, you know, respectively uh, for each of those carriers. Uh, we don't have our final numbers yet, but our forecasts, which came from the uh, Florida Flower uh, Association, said that um, next year they expect uh, similar numbers to this year. And that was around 1.1 billion stems of flowers coming in through the airport. So that translates to about 92 million bouquets of roses, for example, or 325 million roses coming in through our airport. Now, uh, traditionally, Miami International Airport has been the number one airport for flower imports in the United States, with 89% of all flowers entering the U.S. coming through Miami International Airport. So I, we believe that we continue to be uh, uh, at the top of all the other airports in the country for flower imports. And if it's any indication from the carriers uh, on their performance this year, we, we believe we continue to be to be number one. What, um, you know, in addition to your location, what are some of the uh, unique handling characteristics or, or capabilities that you have there in Miami that uh, – are attractive to the to the flower shippers and the carriers. We have over uh, 395,000 square feet of on airport cooler facilities. No other airport can compare with that. We also have on airport USDA um, uh, uh, facilities that can. Uh, basically analyze any pests found on any of the insects. We have two fumigation facilities on the airport. Uh, we have inspectors that have a variety of experiences with all types of perishables coming in through this airport. We see things here that other airports uh, may never see at all. So it's a combination of infrastructure, it's a combination of experience, it's a combination of, of services that are provided here. And in addition to all of that, we have millions upon millions of square feet of off airport uh, cooler facilities for the handling of flowers and perishables. 
So um, now I understand, I thought I saw some statistics that uh, um, Miami's uh, cargo volumes for 2020 were up uh, substantially last year. I know a lot of airports um, suffered declines in cargo volumes, um, but you know a handful did very well. I think Miami was among those. So what do you attribute that to? And, and can you tell us about that growth and, and what commodities it was in? Sure. Uh, last year, we experienced a 2.5% increase. That's a record for us. So we're at 2.3 million uh, tons of cargo being handled at our airport in, uh, in 2020. Um, a lot of that has to do with a combination of things. One is Miami historically has had a different combination of freighter fleet versus passenger fleet. So when the passenger uh, aircraft were grounded, all of that cargo transferred over to the cargo uh, fleet or the cargo freighter operations. And we have uh, over 30 freighter operators here at the airport serving over 120 destinations. And that obviously helped us when uh, the grounding took place because all of that cargo that was in the bellies would, was then moved on the freighter operations. Um, our connectivity to Latin America has also helped us because many of the markets uh, that we serve uh, are the producers of perishables, and perishables were obviously something that continued to, to flow uh, via air. E-commerce uh, was also a factor last year. E-commerce has really taken off, as we all know, and e-commerce plays an important role here, mostly domestic for us, uh, but obviously uh, a big player. All of our integrated carriers' uh, um, volumes were also up, uh, along with Atlas, which flies for, for Amazon, which is one of our main e-commerce uh, carriers here. Gotcha. Well, that, that's great. Uh, congratulations on that. And uh, I'm guessing this year could be uh, very uh, competitive for you as well. Let's, uh, let's switch to talk about vaccine uh, delivery. That's uh, been an area where the air cargo industry's uh, been heavily involved and, um, and there are a lot of expectations around, you know, getting the vaccine out to the public and quickly and air is one of the you know, best ways to do that for long distance. Um, and you've been heavily involved as a board member of the International Air Cargo Association, I believe, in working to inform the, the industry on best practices for cold chain handling of these vaccines. Let me ask you, what is, what is MIA's or Miami's role so far in the, and in the coming months supporting vaccine delivery? Will it be the uh, delivery point for vaccines to South America? Yes, we believe uh, we will be. Uh, we've been uh, delivering vaccines uh, since uh, December of last year. Uh, we expect much larger volumes in the months to come as vaccines uh, begin to be exported to uh, outside of the United States to Latin. Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so we expect the volumes to actually increase uh, much higher than they have been over the last few few weeks and months. Um, but Miami, uh, because of, again, its position, uh, its connectivity to Latin America and the Caribbean, is going to be a key point for the distribution of the vaccines. Uh, we also expect a lot of vaccines to be coming in from Europe and from Asia that will be transiting Miami onto Latin America when those vaccines uh, also uh, are bought by, by the uh, countries in, in that part of the world. Now, in addition to that, what we did here is we launched a task force called um, MIA VAC-19, for Miami Vaccine 19, um, that basically uh, prepared or began to the preparations for uh, the vaccine distribution locally. Uh, as a car community, we work very closely with our federal agencies, with our forwarder community, with our airlines and, and handling companies, and we all came together uh, under this joint task force to plan and prepare for the upcoming uh, distribution of the vaccines. We have ongoing, um, um, uh, I think it's about every two months or so, uh, calls that uh, bring the entire community and we discuss some of the challenges that we're having. Uh, we discuss some of the um, uh, planning that takes uh, has taken place. Uh, for example, and from the airport perspective, we have outlined where we can park all the charter aircraft that could possibly come to the airport, the locations where they're at. We have a trucking and parking staging area uh, prepared and planned for if, uh, if the need is there. 
We have been working with uh, the de-icing uh, companies here at the airport. Uh, I said de-icing, pardon me, for the dry ice uh, uh, for uh, the vaccines, pardon me. <laughs> All this winter weather that everybody's been talking about, uh, it's, it's, it's on the mind, pardon me. Uh, for the dry ice that is required to maintain the temperatures, uh, for us it's a challenge because there is no dry ice actually manufactured in, in Florida. It, it, we we uh, actually bring it in from Georgia. So there's local distribution companies that do the uh, dry ice here. So that's that's been a challenge for us, along with some other things. But uh, again, under this uh, CARB community um, uh, task force that we've had, we're, we're, we're taking every challenge and, and we're meeting them and, and we're discussing uh, what to do uh, next and, and how best to do it. So that, uh, that leads to my question I already was going to ask you, um, that the uh, Tiaka and uh, Pharma.era, which is another uh, umbrella organization that's bringing together stakeholders to talk about and, and collaborate on uh, best practices for dealing with, with these COVID vaccines. You know, they really recently issued a report, I think you were part of it, saying that, you know, airport authorities are the ideal entities to, to be the quarterbacks of vaccine transport because of the central place they have in the in the supply chain and their connections to so many different parties. So you kind of alluded to Miami um, doing that, playing that role, but why is that coordination so important and, and, and how should, air, should more airports, you know, try playing an organizing role like that? I, I absolutely believe so. Uh, I, I think the airport's role is that of a facilitator. Uh, I like what you said as a coordinator or, or a quarterback uh, for the team, and the team is a local community. Um, that's a great analogy. Um, you know, the airport, uh, because of, of, of who they are, can bring the entire community together. And even though there may be competitors between uh different entities that are involved in the community, uh, the airport plays that facilitator role to kind of ease that uh, aside and really focus on, on the common goal of distribution of the vaccines. Because basically, Eric, what we're dealing with is trying to save people's lives, and, and that's what it's all about. The more efficient, the more effective we are uh, in the distribution process of the vaccines, the more lives we're going to be able to save. And that means cooperating and collaborating with each other. And the airport is is uh, can play that role in that quarterback uh, for that team uh, locally. Is there some kind of um, data platform or, you know, information sharing platform that's involved in these kind of, uh, you know, situations or for to, to create that cargo community? Uh, at many airports, that is definitely the case. Uh, at Brussels, at uh, Singapore, uh, at Amsterdam, at and, uh, and many other airports, uh, that is definitely the case. There are cargo community systems that have been set up at those air, uh, as a, at those gateway airports. Uh, unfortunately, Miami is still not there. We are in the process of evaluating uh, which cargo community platform we're going to uh, use, and uh, we hope that this coming year in 2021, we will be able to implement our own cargo community system here. So. Do you think, uh, let me ask you this, Amir, are the, that, that whole, uh, Miami's role as a kind of cargo community coordinator, is that something that you started to do because of the vaccine rollout, or well, have you been doing that overall in, in with, you know, general cargo um, overall, or, and, 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 or has this vaccine initiative you know, spurred uh, my M MIA to, to, to do that more in the future? Uh, we, we have always had um, a community effort here at the airport. Uh, we have a perishable committee that, uh, that meets uh, monthly. Um, we have a, a road show uh, that goes out to uh, uh, countries like uh, Dominican Republic. So we've already been very involved with the community. Uh, for this particular effort for the vaccines, we did create this joint task force um, that is really uh, across the board, uh, including all uh, all players at, at the airport, all major stakeholders. Uh, you know, that means the, the forwarder community, that means the airlines, the ground handling companies, that means the trucking, that means logistics companies. 
Um, that means the, the federal agencies, the Florida Department of Health, um, uh, and, and many others that have been part of this in the private sector that have joined us. Uh, so um, for this particular case, we've expanded our normal um, community per se, beyond our, our normal stakeholders because of the urgency and the need for the distribution of the vaccines um, and and the um, the importance that it had and obviously also uh, the challenge that it is for, for any community because it really goes beyond the airport. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit uh, briefly about the, the cold chain. You, you referenced dry ice and so forth, but and all the, the cooler facilities you have there, the, the cold storage, which obviously is of huge importance with something like flowers and some of the other fruits uh, that come uh, from uh, Latin America. But there's been a lot of discussion or concern, you know, that with the vaccines, a lot of airports wouldn't have enough um, refrigerated storage. How important is refrigerated storage at the end of the day for these vaccines if they're, you know, they're already usually coming in, in insulated boxes or insulated containers, uh, some of them with, you know, battery refrigeration that can be plugged in at the airport. So is that is that infrastructure issue that critical for an airport when it comes to these types of vaccines? I, I think refrigerator uh, facilities are are in very important to to the overall um, um, transportation and distribution of the vaccines. Um, they uh, initially, uh, I think, probably had a more important um, uh, role, let's say, but because of the technology that came in from the manufacturers, from Pfizer and from Moderna and from AstraZeneca and the others, uh, like you were saying, the packaging that they have been able to provide really maintains the ultra cold uh, temperatures necessary. Now, through the logistics process, through the cool chain process, that to maintain that temperature, you must transport that, um, that box or that container inside a active or passive container so that it can move from, let's say, uh, an airport um, or a, a manufacturer's facility to the airport, from the airport, then onto an aircraft, and then onto uh, its destination at another airport, off the, off the aircraft, onto uh, trucking, and then to its final destination. That's a lot of links in that chain. And really, the only way to make sure that uh, that temperature is maintained is a combination of both the internal uh, boxes, uh, temperature from the manufacturer along with the um, um, containers and the uh, cooling facilities that are part of that chain. So uh, to answer your question, I, I think it is very important to have it. Is it absolutely critical? No. You can take uh, a, a Modena uh, container, for example, one of those boxes that they have, put it on a UPS truck and uh, get it to a hospital you know, 300 miles away because it will maintain the temperature. But when you take that same uh, uh, box and you put it uh, on an aircraft and you, now you're transporting it to Brazil, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, so here's where cooling facilities really make, make a difference because they may have to be staged in Miami overnight or maybe two days while it catches the next flight to Brazil. Uh, and when it gets to Brazil, it may have to be stored for a while because in Brazil, they may not have have storage facilities off airport uh, that may require it to um uh, to, to, to stay in, 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 in at the cooler facility at the airport. So it, it, I think it's a critical factor. Uh, it just depends where, um, you know, it may be more important in some areas and maybe less so in others. But in the overall chain, I think it's quite important. And, um, and I just wanted to follow up again on what you mentioned about dry ice, which is a component of keeping uh, these vaccines cold. Uh, the 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 boxes and some of the uh, containers that hold the uh, vaccines are, are have dry ice in them, and and sometimes that needs to be replenished in transit. So you said uh, it's a little bit of a challenge to get the volume of dry ice you need uh, because it's it's not uh, something you normally get that much of, or it comes from the state of Georgia. Can you elaborate on that? 
Sure. Um, this was something that I found out uh, during this process. Um, uh, I was not aware that we did not have dry ice manufacturing in the state of Florida, that it all comes from Georgia. Um, but uh, to this point, Eric, uh, we have not had any issues with dry ice. Uh, we have had enough dry ice um, in our area uh, provided by our local distributors. Uh, so it hasn't been a problem. There have been no uh, issues with any of the uh, vaccine shipments that have come through Miami Airport thus far. Uh, where we feel that it could potentially create uh, some problems is in in the months to come. As vaccine volumes increase, uh, the use of dry ice uh, will probably increase along with it. And we also, as you know, are a transiting point for um, uh, traffic coming in from Asia and from Europe via Miami to Latin America. So if you need to re-ice here at the airport, um, it's not a problem. But if that volume all of a sudden increases to something that our local community wasn't prepared for or not planned for, then it could create a problem. And this is why it's important um, that the Joint Task Force um, prepares and plans for this. And, and we are. We are uh, uh, taking into consideration this possibility, and we have uh, worked with our local community and those distributors to make sure that if the need arises, uh, we have the dry ice that we need to distribute the vaccines from Miami. Down the road, is there a benefit to having, um, you know, something, some dry ice manufacturing that's that's closer or, or with enough planning being in Georgia is fine and you can get it uh, yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. Point. But that, yeah, that's really something that the market uh, will will determine. It's not really up to the airport. Um, I can tell you that, for example, at uh, GRU Airport in Sao Paulo, the, they actually have a dry ice manufacturer on airport uh, uh, that provides them with dry ice. Uh, would I love to have that here in Miami? Yes, I would. But is it something that the market uh, will uh, will accept and 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 uh, and, uh, and put up in, in in our location? Hard to say. It's not really up to me. It's up to the private sector. Gotcha. Well, you know, I'd love to keep uh, talking as well, but it's not up to me. Uh, they're telling me that uh, got to move on, uh, so the time's up. But I really appreciate your time and sharing some of the insights from what's happening down there in Florida uh, for logistics and. Uh, continued success with uh, delivering those critical vaccines. Thank you, Amir. Thank you very much, Eric. It's been a pleasure to talk to you this afternoon.